Welcome back for Episode 5 of the Astronomical Apocrypha, the Seleucid Empire Let's Play for Rome II with Dividaid Empira. Last time, the Seleucid Empire came under intense assault from the south with hordes of Nabataeans threatening Antiochus II at Jerusalem. Battered but victorious after a protracted battle, the thunderbolts of Zeus withstood a deluge of Arabian spearmen, although Dura was lost to the Kidri in advance of Diogenes' arrival, who could do no more than watch the sack of the city from across the river. In the north, Euclid continued trading blows with the Pontians in the absence of Antiochus Soter, losing Edessa but gaining Samosata, staunchly defending his new acquisition and repaying the Pontians with a murderous assault from his royal peltasts, although Antiochus's prized war elephants perished in the fighting on the recommendation of a very unconventional war council. For his own part, Antiochus Soter was able to briefly return to the front, inflicting a defeat upon a small but elite Egyptian force, the Claws of the Sphinx, but he continues to suffer the ignominy of territorial losses with other factions now encroaching on the core of his empire, and he must likewise endure the ongoing affliction of his not yet fully healed chest wound, inflicted on behalf of his treacherous elder son, Seleucos the Usurper. Where is he? He can't have gotten far, but soon the desert will cover his tracks. I hear his manacles. Look, there he goes. After him, don't let our prize get away. Why running away, Prince? Your father will surely pay a king's ransom to have you back. I doubt that very much, but try as you like. What is he talking about? I don't know. Shut up, Prince, and keep your head down. There is now a gaping hole in the center of our territory, with the northern tip of Mesopotamia, Edessa, having been taken by Pontos, although Euclid's gains have also split their territory into two pieces. I am still trying to work on some alliance the with the Antigonids, the who remain you. friendly and I have worked them up to non-aggression, and now a military like a access treaty. I am not willing to pay for defensive alliance, pointless. although I think they will agree to it soon. I am able to convince them to trade, although I am not able to get any money from them since their interest wanes quickly when there's a fee involved. In Rome too, in contrast to Attila, you can't fine-tune your monetary requests, and even less so with the wealthier factions. Here the Antigonids are so wealthy it's either 2,000 talents or nothing. They won't pay the 2,000 so I shake hands on an even trade agreement. I'm reacquiring trade with Hyastan slash Armenia who also remain our defensive ally and partner in the war on Pontos. And I can also get another trade agreement with Epiros, the shipping lanes now clear of Cypriot and Ptolemaic intrusion for the most part. Having repelled the Pontians, but with the dragons of Belmarduk in relatively poor shape, Euclid recruits some more cavalry which thankfully are available due to the existing Greek culture and buildings in Samosata. Having significant funds at my disposal currently, I set him up with some relatively powerful citizen cavalry, and I add a couple of Makairophori melee swordsmen to round out the roster, while pruning and merging the depleted regiments already in the army. I temporarily raise a new retinue of royal peltasts for the seaworthy Admiral Cordillian, since Galatia at Cappadocia is on the verge of rebellion, although I don't ultimately wind up putting him to much use. 
Eurydice attempts to poison the wells at Petra, and although she has success, mousing over the garrison it appears to have done literally nothing. I'm not sure what to make of this. I know her philosophic trait reduces the effectiveness of poison, but it seems her ability has been crippled entirely for some reason. Last episode, we had one of the local magistrates begging for assistance with his barren lands in the wake of a failed harvest. He says this can't happen two years in a row, and we'll now hear his appeal. There's a 15% penalty to agriculture from this event, but we have the option of fertilizing the land, irrigating the land, or of praying to the gods to ward off future disaster. Or we can simply do nothing in the face of this crisis. Antiochus, though religious, is a pragmatic man, and the Seleucids are known for their aggressive approach to engineering the local situation to suit their needs. And I think we should alter the flow of water to ensure a bountiful crop next year, so I choose irrigation. With what's left of my surplus of funds, I invest in another regiment of Phalangatai pikemen for the hammers of Hephaestos as they stare powerless across the river at the quite well-defended former Seleucid-controlled city of Dura, now in the hands of the Kidri. During the intern phase, there is some movement by our Armenian allies on their way toward Edessa, which concerns me, although there's little I can do, and a tremendous number of Parsa forces have crossed the border into Mesopotamia, even more concerning, although they ostensibly remain friendly for now. We've now got new rebellions underway in two provinces, Comagene and Judea. It's a little odd because some of these regions don't match what is on the map, but we'll sort out where they are in a bit. We've also finished research on organized supply and have several rank-ups to do for the provincial noblewomen. In Syria, Antiochus' summer labor to redirect the water for irrigation has resulted in an excellent harvest, a, quote, bountiful hunt, according to the event, probably a typo. We get two turns of additional five food in all provinces, which is excellent. On to our next upgrade. I'm going to continue on with military investments, starting with engineering that will let us get the workshop and some engines of war to help out our conquests. As a result of his ruthless but some would say necessary killing of his treacherous eldest son, Antiochus has gained a new household follower, his own son's executioner. I try one more time to sabotage the garrison at Petra by poisoning them with Eurydice, but again, inexplicably, no casualties are suffered in spite of a successful attempt. Eudokia also tries her luck against the Egyptian spy at Jerusalem, but to no effect. There are nearby rebels gathering forces and raiding, but Antiochus II leaves them alone for now to muster his own levy forces. I continue building up the dragons of Belmarduk, feeling that they aren't yet quite strong enough to push in either direction of Pontus's territory, and likewise the hammers of Hephaestos add a couple of light cavalry to strengthen their defense of the northern bank of the Euphrates River. During the intern phase, more movement by Parsa through Mesopotamia, and there's more rebel activity in Asia Minor. We get a new mission to defeat the Pontian army, the ravaging Chimeras, although I'm not sure we'll be able to reach them in a timely fashion, as Armenia have made good use of their turn to capture Edessa and are now in range to eliminate the Pontos army themselves. This is a big disappointment, more so for the city than the mission, as I won't be able to reclaim my own settlement without making an enemy of Armenia, an enemy I can't afford right now. Euclid and the dragons of Belmarduk track down and then eliminate the rebels outside of Samosata, and the dragons take relatively light casualties in an auto-resolve. I've almost finished building up the dragons, but I add just a couple of hoplite regiments to the mix, while the hammers of Hephaestos are now approaching a more respectable roster, adding still more melee and pike infantry to their ranks. Antiochus II then takes care of the other rebels at Judea, or Jerusalem, or northern Nabataea, or Seal Syria, or Palestine, or the southern Levant, or whatever it happens to be called on a given day. This is an easy auto-resolve for him, with very few losses and complete elimination of the Egyptian rebel army. The nearby settlement of Petra is now looking very inviting for an assault, although they have walls and a moderate garrison who are immune to toxins. The accompanying army consists only of a general and his retinue designated to guard the city. The balance bar is in my favor, but the auto-resolve suggests I'll suffer terrible casualties, so I'll soften the defenders with a couple turns of siege while Antiochus and his capable men of the Thunderbolts craft some ladders and a battering ram. Her skills of no use in Petra, Eurydice sets off west, swiftly crossing the entirety of southern Judea in a single season to arrive in eastern Alexandria just to keep an eye on the Egyptians should they decide to sneak a force in to reclaim Jerusalem. During the intern phase, Katpachika have raised a small but respectable military 
and seem to be on their way northward. We learn that Mamlaktha and Nabata are not to be trusted, not in the least as they redeclare war on us only a few turns after the prior conflict was ended at their request. Once again, the sword of Arabian aggression is represented not by the Nabataeans themselves, but by their satrapy, the Kidri, who immediately move on Diogenes and his army crossing the Euphrates to confront him on the northern bank. With their city garrison in range, the odds are overwhelmingly against us, so I pull back from the defense. With the enemy unable to pursue, we land back in our own turn without any fighting having actually taken place yet. Eurydice ventures further west into Egypt to the eastern bank of the Nile River, where she spots an Egyptian warrior, a brave of the king prowling the opposite river bank. I try poison again to assassinate the man, but Eurydice fails and now her presence in Egypt is exposed. A repeat attempt by Eudokia to destroy the Egyptian spy at Jerusalem also fails. Antiochus II is still besieging Petra, and unfortunately we seem to be suffering attrition at about the same rate as the defenders, so I'll have to assault the walls within the next couple of turns, although I want him to finish building his equipment. Diogenes, still at the northern bank of the Euphrates, but only having shifted his encampment slightly westward, continues his recruiting effort, adding a couple of hoplite regiments. Before he can get his recruitment done, however, he's again interrupted by a Kidri assault. But this time, they aren't in range of their garrison reinforcements, so it's ostensibly a fairer fight. With that said, we still have a large deficit on the balance bar to overcome the enemy army boasting greater numbers, but being composed of mostly inferior townsfolk and levy infantry. They do have a significant cavalry advantage, having qu twice as many light horsemen as the hammers do. I don't know for sure if we can win this battle, but I want to at least try to stop the Kidri incursion into our territory, although it's possible that Diogenes will wind up like his colleague Archelaus, a posthumous war hero. It looks like the enemy already made the river crossing at the bridge several miles downstream, so we'll be fighting a regular field battle, not a river crossing. There's a gentle slope to the battlefield, and we're in command of the high ground of this gentle grade. I set up on the western half of the deployment zone, facing south, with Diogenes and his companion cavalry hidden along with the adjacent light skirmish cavalry in the small patch of trees on the southwestern corner of the deployment zone. The rest of the army sets up with a screen of archers followed by spearmen, pikes, and swordsmen to the general's left. The enemy are seen marching toward us in no particular hurry, making a slow, determined advance on our infantry position with a fairly balanced line similar to our own, with the regular footmen preceded by skirmishers. I'm counting on my pikemen to hold the line here, while the Makarophori and the cavalry do most of the damage. I put my pikes into a wall formation and shift the army rightward into a tighter formation so we can focus on their western flank. Unfortunately, Diogenes' ruse is quickly up as his men are spotted amongst the trees and he sets off with the rest of the cavalry to turn the enemy's western flank if possible. The battle starts off as you might expect, with the archers trading fire as the pikes shuffle into position, but I manage to swing my Makarophora around to the western end of the enemy position where they clash with the Arabian spearmen. The Makarophora, although are not particularly well armored, should perform well against low-quality spearmen, and as the hand-to-hand -hand fighting gets underway, Diogenes and his horsemen make an effort to engage the enemy skirmish cavalry. My own archers rain arrows into the mass of enemy spearmen fighting my swordsmen, and as Diogenes encourages his low-morale skirmish cavalry to defeat the Arabian light horsemen, the second unit of Makarophori heads right into the heart of the enemy line. I refocus my archer fire on the oncoming enemies on our left flank, including the remaining three Arabian skirmisher cavalry. As we're making progress on the right, I want my levy pikes to reorient themselves to face the center of the enemy army, while my phalangatai pikes are holding the left flank. The Makarophori continue their excellent work, biting hard into the western enemy flank, although I know they can't keep up the pressure indefinitely due to fatigue and their light armor. Our light cavalry pause to toss some javelins into the melee to give our infantry a bit of a boost against the Arabian tribal spearmen. Meanwhile, our front line of pikes have confronted the vanguard of the enemy line in a slightly messy engagement, although we're still maintaining a slightly jagged front line of troops. Diogenes himself heads in for a flank charge against the Arabian tribal spearmen, a bold if risky gambit, while his less enthusiastic skirmish cavalry continue to launch their javelins. Under the continual assault of sword and javelin, the right side of the enemy army is beginning to collapse, several units wavering or routing, 
and Diogenes orders his retinue in for another cycle charge. After pulling back briefly toward the enemy rear, Diogenes watches as the Makarophori close in and the enemy right-hand flank continues to crumble and he strikes even deeper into the Arabian formation. As the enemy have begun to buckle under the pressure of the assault, having been pushed back from our central line of levy pikemen, I order the pikes forward slowly as the archers continue the ranged duel with their enemy counterparts. It seems that the skirmish cavalry on both sides have exhausted their ammunition, although this has led to a suicidal frontal assault on one of my pike phalanges by the enemy skirmish cavalry. Although it should be noted by this point, my phalangatai pikemen are severely depleted and in danger of routing at any moment, so it's quite possible that they gambled on the shock of their charge to turn the tide. I have almost all of the enemy spear regiments in retreat now, although Capu said the enemy general and his retinue of Sabaean nobles are still at full strength and just now engaging my Makairophori swordsmen. My archers focus fire on the last remaining regiment of spearmen left behind by their fleeing comrades, and the bulk of my infantry swarm around Capusa to surround the enemy general and his retinue. Among the chaos of the disorganized enemy retreat, Diogenes breaks another unit of Arabian skirmisher cavalry and then sends his own accompanying regiment of light horsemen into the adjacent enemy archers while his own retinue crashes into another regiment of fleeing spearmen, shattering them. There's tremendous carnage as Diogenes and his horsemen ride rampant through the fleeing Arabian infantry, our own general and his men trying hard to keep up the pressure, as there's still a considerable number of infantry regiments that could prove dangerous if they rally. Meanwhile, Capusa and his own retinue of heavily armed noble spearmen are really holding out well against my infantry in spite of being surrounded on all sides. I focus all the infantry I have, swordsmen, pikes, and archers, on the Arabian general's bodyguard. Although I've lost three of my Phalangatai pike regiments, and one of the Makarafora units is also in retreat. Two of the enemy spear regiments rally at the periphery of the battle and turn on my remaining light horse unit, who are themselves now forced back, being no match for an organized regiment of spearmen. It starts looking even worse, as three of my archer units have exhausted their arrows and Capusa breaks the other Makarafora regiment, along with one of the levy pike units, and two of my archer regiments throw down their bows draw their daggers, and charge into a suicidal melee with the enemy general's bodyguard. In desperation, Diogenes and his horsemen break off their pursuit of the fleeing Arabian archers and wheel their horses around toward Capus's retinue. My remaining regiment of light skirmish cavalry have already closed range with the enemy general and add what impetus they can with the charge into the general's flank. Although the charge itself does relatively light damage, the morale shock is enough to cause Capus's retinue to begin wavering. It's just enough that the success of charge by Diogenes and the heavy shock cavalry is devastating. Breaking the Arabian general's bodyguard and scattering the men before the thundering hooves of the Greek cavalry. It doesn't take long to shatter the Arabian general's retinue completely, although Diogenes isn't afforded the time to chase down the general himself, as now five Arabian spear regiments at varying strength have regained their composure with their general's life at stake and are now returning to the fight in waves. The first two encounter my levy pikemen and the now arrowless archers in what has degenerated into a small but desperate scrappy fight for control of this patch of desert near the Euphrates. The archers and the pikes overpower the first unit of spearmen and Diogenes quickly crushes another with the charge into their flank. Victory is now within reach, but the situation is still quite dicey. Diogenes withdraws before another unit of spearmen, just long enough for my archers to fix them in melee then quickly brings about his cavalry for a murderous rear assault. Off to the west, near the small patch of trees, my Makairophori and the other Levy Pike regiment are struggling to maintain their nerve in pursuit of one of the two remaining enemy archer regiments. It's too much for the Levy Pikes, who shatter and are gone from the battle for good. Diogenes uses up his last Inspire boost, hoping that will keep around my other Pike regiment just long enough to put away the last few enemy regiments. There's now a bit of maneuvering on both sides as I try to line up my pikes and Diogenes' heteroi cavalry to strike down the Arabian archers and spears on one side as the other regiment of Arabian spears approach from our rear. I'm finally able to trap the Arabian spearmen with my pikes and another flank charge by a Diogenes breaks them. Although there's one unit of Arabian spears remaining, they become separated from the archers who are now a prime target for my shock cavalry. First one and then the other Arabian archer regiment fall to cavalry charges, while my pike levy simply interpose themselves between the enemy spears and their comrades, eventually forcing the enemy to engage. Ah. 
I'm just like the rest of you fellows. Careful, Agarios. Spear them from a distance. These Kidri are vicious, and they still have their knives. I was saying, I'm just like you. Grant you, I'm wealthier. Wealthier by far, and of course my estate in Seleucia dwarfs what most of you are capable of imagining. But as I was saying, I'm just like you. Well, let's be frank. The one thing that you men have in common with me, we all just want to get back to Seleucia in one piece. And I don't mind spilling a bit of Bedouin blood on the way. So hold strong, and maybe we can get out of this alive. Or if you prefer a heroic death like Archelaus, I'll be the first to recommend you for posthumous honors. My last regiment of archers have finally had enough of the fighting and rout, while at the same time both the last enemy unit of spearmen and my own remaining levy pike regiment rout simultaneously, leaving Diogenes and his half-strength retinue the last men standing on the battlefield. We almost couldn't have cut it any closer, losing over 2,000 of our own men, but killing over 3,200 of the enemy in reprisal. Other than the pikemen, who mainly served to hold the line, virtually every other unit got loads of kills, with each archer regiment getting between 150 and 230 kills, the light cavalry getting 300 to 400 kills each, and Diogenes' own retinue achieving a staggering 900 kill count. It looks like we managed to wipe out all of the enemy regiments, except just one spear unit and the enemy general himself, who appears to have escaped just by the skin of his teeth. They head back to Dura, but Diogenes has held the Euphrates against a tremendous Arabian assault, and he lived to tell the tale. Rhodes offer us a military alliance, and I accept. I might one day want to push my way into Greece, Thrace, and Macedonia. But I like having a couple of allies in the Mediterranean for now, to dissuade any mischief by Egypt. Lo and behold, Antiochus Soter has finally returned to active duty, and it's no surprise that Diogenes has earned himself a rank up after the brawl by the river. It's time for Antiochus to finally take back his army from Euclid, who has kept the force in reasonable shape, minus the elephants. Diogenes, who managed to hold off the enemy assault, gets a significant replenishment of his regiments, and as another benefit of holding his ground, his recruitment of the Hoplite regiments went uninterrupted. So now we actually have a moderate-sized force. I merge some of the depleted regiments, and then add to his force with some Mesopotamian mercenary spearmen and archers with so many available in the local province, along with a single unit of Asaparani heavy cavalry mercenaries. This greatly enhanced force is just what we need to press the attack on the Kidri, so Diogenes marches across the Euphrates straight to the city of Dura, re encounters the moderate sized garrison force, along with the shreds that remain of Capius' army. We have reasonable odds in the auto resolve, so I take it destroying the enemy forces and finally reclaiming Dura for the Seleucids. Although I like the mercenaries, I just can't afford them, so I go ahead and disband the Mesopotamian cavalry and the archers, although I leave the mercenary spirits for now, while I recruit some of my own Hoplite and archer regiments from the region. The small Pontos army we were supposed to destroy set sail from the remaining capital region into the Black Sea, while it seems our ally Katpachika have arrived just ahead of Antiochus and the dragons to the walls of Sinope. The Katpachikans, our satrapy, claim Sinope for their own territory, and wiping out the territories of Pontos, who live on only because of their we fleet who embarked on the Black Sea. With our trade routes restored with the recapture of Dura, Drangiana are eager to restart our trade agreement, and we get a little monetary compensation for the money lost during the Kidri occupation as well. The Thunderbolts of Zeus continue to suffer attrition at the walls of Petra, and I do, as some have suggested, need to equip some of these armies with a baggage train when I get the chance, and I think this would prevent some of this from happening. Nevertheless, the attrition is mutual, and we now have a pretty good collection of siege equipment to take the city. I actually have a reasonable auto-resolve chance here, and I'll probably struggle to keep my losses as low as what the game would give me, but nevertheless, I'd like to fight this battle, since it looks like it could be a good one. Petra has an interesting map, with the settlement actually occupying a small part on the eastern half of the map, an east-west long-axis rectangle, with gates at the western, southern, and eastern walls. I'm going to focus on the western gate with my single battering ram powered by the Hoplite Regiment, while I have four ladders with Hyrcanian hillmen with which to confront the defenders at the wall, and four tortoises to protect my lightly armored but deadly Makarophori and Pike Regiments. Antiochus II, will command from the hilltop overlooking the assault for now, accompanying his Jewish slinger levies. 
I give the battering ram the slowest siege engine, a small head start before I send my archers forward to begin trading fire with the enemies on the ramparts. With the ram halfway to the gate, I start trundling the tortoises forward, since I know these can take a bit more punishment than the ladders. A few moments later, with the ram almost to the wall, I start moving in my ladders with the hillmen to assault the segment of wall running south from the gate. The timing works out reasonably well, with the ram hitting the gate only slightly in advance of the towers lining up against the wall, and the tortoises are just a short way behind. I haven't lost any siege engines to fire arrows yet, and the tortoises are actually soaking up a reasonable amount of the enemy fire. The ram makes quick work of the gate, demolishing it just as the first few Hurricanian hillmen leap screaming onto the ramparts brandishing their crude weapons against the enemy archers and spearmen lining the wall. The hoplite drop their battering ram and move out of the way for the Makarophori, who abandon their tortoise and charge through the gate to reach the first regiment of Egyptian spearmen. The hillmen are engaged in a bit of a struggle, although at least they are keeping the enemy on the walls busy, while my Makarophori do the real work of clearing the gate. With this underway, my levy spearmen advance toward the gatehouse to back up their comrades inside. As my infantry stream through the gate, Antiochus moves forward to support the men, and the hillmen have driven the enemy archers back from the wall adjacent to the gate, although several enemy units remain to the south. The Ptolemaic citizen militia hold out a surprisingly long time against the Makarophori, and I send my spear levies around the inside of the northern wall in a flanking maneuver, pausing to capture the tower at the northwestern corner of the city. With the northwestern tower under Seleucid control, several enemy units are now wavering, and my hillmen move to capture the southwestern tower, driving off the spearmen on the wall and engaging the archers there. With both towers now under control, Antiochus himself enters the city, the Makarophori driving off the Ptolemaic citizen militia. The Jewish levy spear is set to work securing the capture point in the northwestern square, confronting another Ptolemaic spear unit there, and the Makarophori advance toward the settlement center where the remainder of the enemy's garrison and their visiting general await. The enemy in the center of the city do not seem eager to leave their defense of the victory point, so I spend some time cleaning up the defenders at the periphery of the city, the Makarophori flank charging the Ptolemaic citizen militia fighting my spearmen at the capture point. We've done okay so far, but it's been a bit of a brutal assault as the Hillman regiments have almost been destroyed and one of the Makarophori regiments couldn't sustain their assault against the enemy spears. Eventually, the citizen militia at the capture point are overpowered and the point becomes ours. I next set about surrounding the enemy in the city center and taking the adjacent towers, my Jewish levy taking the northern tower and my Iranian skirmishers securing the southern tower. A unit of Ptolemaic armed townsfolk moved threateningly toward the Jewish levy at the northern tower, but think better of their assault as the other two levy regiments move in from the street facing their flank and they retreat toward the general's retinue at the capture point. However, my lead unit of levies managed to catch them before they can get away, embroiling the mob in a melee. The armed townsfolk aren't really a match for anything, so this match should go in our favor. With both towers now under our control, the javelin skirmishers move eastward to take the southern gatehouse, while my slingers line up at the southern entrance to the town center, and the Makarophori engage the town militia at the western entrance to the town center, ultimately breaking but drawing the Ptolemaic infantry out into the open where they're assaulted by Antiochus and a nearby Jewish levy regiment. My archers mob the garrison commander's spear regiment at the southern wall as my pike levy enters the fray against the Ptolemaic citizen militia on the western approach. After a little hand-to-hand -hand fighting, both fights eventually go our way, and my archers strike against the last town militia unit. The Phalangatai pikemen line up in the western street, facing off against the enemy general setting up a pike wall and slowly marching down the avenue as the Jewish levy coming from the northern tower charge into the rear of the enemy general. Though a superior unit, Eder and his Galatian Royal Guard, an interesting general regiment for the Ptolemies actually, just can't sustain their defense, attacked as they are from both sides and having lost all of their allied units already, and they actually break fairly quickly under the pressure. Don't let them kill all of those ferocious Galatian warriors. I need to speak to their leader. What in the name of Zeus is he doing commanding an Egyptian Greek garrison in the heart of Nabataea? Ptolemy's alliance against us may be more broad than we suspected. 
We will have to strike into the heart of Egypt sooner or later, but for now send word to my father the king and await his reply. My brother's corpse is barely cold, and I do not want the king's caution to give way to paranoia. Round up the Jewish levies and put them to work reorganizing the defenses at once. Those magnificent tombs carved in the rock are for Nabataean royalty, and they may bridle at any Greek occupation. We won the battle, although I actually came up much worse than predicted, losing about 40% of the army in the process. The predicted losses were more in the range of 25 to 30%. There were probably better ways to go about this siege, although I think it's mostly a game imbalance that the auto-resolve is so generous in this scenario compared to other battles that we've seen. So we finally managed to kick the Ptolemies out of the Levant and open the way to the rest of Nabataea, while the Kidri are now vulnerable to an assault on their home turf as well. Antiochus II merges his depleted units and adds a couple more levy spearmen recruits, and he gets the night battle ability for himself like his father. Diogenes has replenished most of his army, and I feel confident now to disband the mercenary spears, replacing them with more of my own infantry soldiers. I don't really have a target in mind for Antiochus Soter and the dragons of Belmarduk, with the situation in Asia Minor essentially stabilized, although I might try for Trapezos, a Pontian ally and another potential port on the Black Sea. My finances are now in reasonable shape, but I can now put the taxes back to a medium level to encourage some public order and growth. I'm also able to secure a trade agreement with the Hagar who own a port in the Persian Gulf and reinitiate trade with the neighboring Mascat. The Empire is now in a more stable state than we've seen in quite some time, although the war rages on with Ptolemy II Philadelphus. We've pushed his forces all the way back to their home province of Egypt, and both the Nabataeans and the Kidri have been rebuked and are now on the defensive as we have a pathway open to their territories through Petra. Antiochus Soter has finally returned from his long convalescence to command the dragons of Belmarduk, although the situation in Asia Minor has nearly stabilized with Pontos defeated and their ally Trapozos now on our crosshairs. It remains to be seen whether his successful but audacious younger son, and the stalwart Diogenes can capitalize on their recent gains to spread Seleucid authority to Arabia. Thanks for watching and join me again next time for another episode of the Astronomical Apocrypha.